So the next of the synthetic polymers is a big mouthful, polyterafluorothylene. <laughs> this one has another name. You would know it as Teflon. So yeah, polytetrafluorothylene is Teflon. So why does it have this name? So poly obviously for the polymer, tetra for four, and fluoro for fluorine. If you look down here in the monomer, it has four, whoop, four fluorines attached to its monomer. And so <clears throat> that's why it has such a big name. So what do we use Teflon for? I hope that you recognize Teflon from pans, from nonstick pans. Um, and that is the big reason why we have Teflon. Um, it works to create a nonstick surface. And that is because these fluorine atoms, when they are bound to something like carbon or even to each other, they tend not to have molecular attraction to other material. So they tend not to attract to your food or whatever it might be. And so it works really well as a nonstick material. The other reason why these work, uh, it works so well as a nonstick material in pans is because these carbon fluorine bonds are incredibly strong with each other. And so it allows us to use them with high heat, hence why they work really well with something like a nonstick pan. So you can cook with it and the Teflon will stay intact. Those bonds stay with each other and don't allow things to stick to them. Um, the downside, if you have Teflon pans that you may know about, is eventually that's, that coating starts to peel because eventually the um, Teflon will stop bonding to the actual pan, and so you lose your nonstick coating. All right, next one. Oh. So we've got nylon. So nylon is an interesting polymer, an interesting synthetic, because it's actually what we call a copolymer. It's made out of two different monomers, but it also is a condensation polymer. So I told you we'd look at a picture. Um, and so here we've got our two different polymers. So you can see it is a copolymer. So it's made up of two monomers, right? Two very different, uh, pieces, but when they're joined together, and you can see they have two different ends, they both have what we call the functional groups. This one has the um, double bonded oxygen with the oxygen and the hydrogen. This one has one we didn't look at, but this is also a functional group, the nitrogen with the hydrogens. And so when these bond together, we can tell it's a condensation because we lose water. And so then down here, you can see it's putting more of them together, losing more water until we get our polymer of nylon. And nylon is interesting because it was actually created um, by DuPont chemists, kind of a little bit by accident, but they figured out really quickly that it could be a very useful material and still used all over the place today. Um, it's used in hosiery, it's used in different types of fabrics, so you can see up close how that's done. And what's interesting is how that works. If you've ever looked at nylon up close, it's actually made up of a bunch of multiple single fibers that are woven together in a bigger fiber. And that's actually part of what gives it its strength. Um, and so it's easiest to see this in a nylon rope. If you ever take a look at a nylon rope, you can see that the, it has those individual fibers that it has been twisted together um, um, because that's how the polymerization works. The polymerization only creates that long, thin string of the polymer. Um, parachutes, carpets, uh, nylon's everywhere. So it's been an incredibly uh, useful polymer since it was created. We also have this one, polyethylene terephthalate, PET. 
And this one is all over the place as well. Um, this is what makes up your soda bottles, um, your number one plastics. You can see all kinds of stuff here. We've got fruit containers, microwavable trays. We make insulation now out of this. Um, clothing. So um, a lot of our drinking bottles actually get recycled into the, um, what do you call it? The insulation, the uh, the interior of jackets and so forth, but they're even now making the actual cloth out of um, the PET, PETE, that's the other name for it, um, carpeting, all kinds of crazy stuff. Also, um, a form of polyester, Dacron, specifically polyester. Um, that's the cloth and, cloth and stuffing that a lot of these clothes and uh, the synthetic carpets made out of. And then the reason why I've got the bag here is Mylar is also made out of this. Um, and so Mylar for Mylar balloons, but also for food storage bags and for blankets and so forth. Um, the plastic is made with one side of it with that reflective surface on it. So lots and lots and lots of uses for just this one single um, polymer. There is one other set of synthetic polymers, and that are, is the thermoset polymers. These were actually the first set of synthetic polymers to be created. And they're different from the other ones. So a lot of the other ones I've talked about so far can actually be recycled, um, whether it's recycled into the same material or um, downcycled into other uh, synthetic polymers. These thermoset polymers are, it, it's a one-time deal. So when these are created, the polymer chains get locked into a 3D rigid network, and that's it. They are, they're done um, once they're in that uh, locked network. What that does is make for incredibly strong and durable polymers. And that's great. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures of some of these thermoset polymers that are still in you know, in use today, we still actually use some of them. Um, but some of these thermoset polymers, we still have the pieces around today, not because we're using them, but because they can't be recycled and they don't break down. Uh, so they can't be remelted or reshaped once they're put into place. So that's a downside, and that's why we don't really use many thermoset polymers anymore, because we can't do anything with them once they're done. So the common names um, or brand names for thermoset polymers are Melmac, Formica, and Bakelite. Uh, the one of these that I know commonly is still used is Formica, and that is for countertops. You can still get, in some places, Melmac. Melmac is mainly for dishware. Bakelite, I don't believe is being made anymore, but you can find plenty of Bakelite items still around. So let's take a look at what these look like. So here are the Bakelite items. This is what I was talking about. There's still plenty of these around. Even if they're in pieces, they're still around. So the uh, Bakelite phone, this is one of the first ones um, that they use the thermosets for. Uh, not necessarily this one, but um, Bakelite radios. And then this is one of the few things we still use the thermosets for. And that is to make pool balls or billiard balls because these need to be incredibly tough. And before we actually started making them out of thermosets. They were made out of ivory. And so this was a big advantage when we started making thermosets because that reduced the demand for ivory, at least in one sector. And so the pool, unless you find a really, really old set of pool balls, um, all of the pool balls, billiard balls today are gonna be made out of Bakelite. Um, it takes a lot to destroy one of these. 
Um, and that's why they last for such a long time. And then the last thing to look at are the natural polymers. So nature makes polymers too. That's actually where we got the idea for a lot of these. So natural polymers that you would probably run into, there are actually um, a lot of natural polymers, but ones that you would come across commonly. Um, one group is the proteins. Um, these are amino acids that have been bonded together, created by animals. And so, um, you know, we all make these. This is actually, um, proteins are what we eat, for example, um, in meat and so forth. Um, you also find proteins in plants. But as far as how you might work with natural polymers that are proteins, these would be found in fabrics like silk, leather, and wool. So if we take a look, this is how they're built. So you can see the individual units and they're held together by bonds right here. Um, these are actually put together as a condensation polymer. Nature does that as well. Um, and so you can see um, where the, those guys come from. Um, and so these natural polymers, um, you know, we can make into these uh, products of silk, leather, and wool. So we don't have to make all of our fabrics, obviously, out of synthetics. We do have a good number of them, but we can do a lot of fabric work out of natural polymers. We also have cellulose. Cellulose is the other major natural polymer that um, we can talk about uh, as far as related to this course. These are bonded sugars created by plants. Now this one cannot be made by animals. Um, we do make bonded sugars, but not cellulose. And this is going to be found in fabrics like cotton, linen, hemp, ramy, and bamboo. And uh, bamboo especially is coming onto the market as a great natural polymer fabric and fiber uh, because of the texture and the fact that you can grow it very quickly. So it's a very renewable type of polymer um, and it breaks down unlike our synthetic polymers. And so you can see there, some of these different guys. So this one, um, this one's the, this is the hemp. Yeah, that's the hemp, the linen, and then we've got cotton, and I believe that's the bamboo fiber. So um, that is the end of organic chemistry. So ending with the natural fibers, the natural polymers, and that's also the end of the chemistry unit.